Welcome to the Weekly Squeak, your weekly geeky squeak with me, Chris Chinchilla. I hope you are all doing well out there. You're all healthy and about as sane and um, as, yeah, I think as sane <laughs> as you can be right now. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the uh, last episode that I um, put out with an interview with Critical Start about uh, cybersecurity in the time of a crisis. Actually, it ended up being quite current. There's been a lot more in the news recently, so that podcast came out at just the right time. I'm continuing to produce quite a lot of things here. I will tell you some more of those a little bit after the interview in the show, which uh, the interview this week is with Quinn Slack, awesome name, of Sourcegraph, uh, where we talk about Sourcegraph's quite amazing uh, code search tool. Um, it's an interesting interview, actually, because the product itself is very comprehensive but very simple to use. So <laughs> I think we both repeated ourselves quite a lot in trying to explain what they did. Anyway, hope you enjoyed that interview. And in the meantime, let's get down to my links for the week. First, a great little uh, roundup post from Simon Holdorf on the Better Programming Medium blog called 10 Extraordinary GitHub Repos for All Developers. So GitHub repos, um, let's just, if you're not sure what that means, let's just call this uh, sources of information, places to find things for developers. I mean, if you are a developer, you probably know what GitHub is, but just to explain that a bit there. There's some uh, quite interesting things here. Some of my favorites are uh, a lot of tutorials on building your own X, um, an X being a multitude of different things, free programming books, um, quite interesting. This is obviously a very good time to be learning things. In fact, I have dozens of online courses and books that I really want to get around to learning. But I have, well, I'm very lucky that I've been busy working, um, which is good. Can't complain. But uh, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, time for some people to learn some new skills when hopefully we kind of uh, come on the other side. So some good resources there. And also some of the more practical ones for developers, templates for gitignore files and system design primers, some good underpinnings to get your project started with there. And there's more. I've only mentioned uh, not even half. Obviously, there's another five or six there for you to find. So if that article appeals to you, go jump in and pick up some new knowledge and tips. Next. Um, so I have been reworking with a new co-designer, um, Andy. I'll just call him that for now. The chip shop board game that I started some years ago. In fact, I think when I first started this podcast, even maybe. I'm not sure if that's actually what the podcast initially was. I can't even remember now. I have to go back and look. This is a board game that I, yeah, it was on hiatus for some time. Um, where you run a 1980s computer company in America. Um, and you get to try and release products at the pop population demand and you have personalities and resources to help you etc etc so i'm reworking that game so i have been back doing a lot of research and going down all sorts of rabbit holes of uh, retro computing and old computers from the 80s and a computer that i remember very fondly and i'm pretty sure i've mentioned this several times in the past was the amiga and i don't know if you knew this but um actually this is an old article from 2012 on Computer World by Rohan Pierce talking about the release of Amiga S4. <laughs> yeah, they actually released newer versions of Amiga OS uh, less than 10 years ago. And it's quite an interesting profile um, of, of what this operating system release was. And I think I found another article, not this one, um, that was an interview with uh, one of the programmers as well. It's now put out by a Belgian company, I think. I really wanted to try it, but it is not open source and only runs on particular PowerPC, which is a, a processor architecture-based hardware, which I don't have access to. And um, I probably could emulate it, but I'd have to pay for it when I don't really have any use for it, apart from nostalgia. But still, if you're interested to see, well, at least six or seven years ago, how um, an old classic operating system um was still developing then uh, go and have a read and maybe have a play and let me know if you experimented with amiga os4 i'd love to know your thoughts and if you used it for anything practical in your day-to-day -day life next an article on uh, dazed i'm guessing this might be the uh, digital wing of days of confused i'm not sure an article by Britt dawson uh, about uh well about a couple but kind of mostly about one person this couple is tanya corin 
and her boyfriend, Josh Harris. How back in the early 2000s, they were kind of... I wonder if this was before Big Brother or about the same time as Big Brother. I'm not sure. But they were one of the first people to kind of string their lives. Um, And this may not seem so unusual now, although I don't know how many people really string their lives as opposed to edited highlights of their life. But um, And the article is interesting because it obviously goes into the pressure this had on their lives. Um, And it did have a lot of pressure and ended up breaking up. Um, but also kind of the embracing of very early uh, technology to do this sort of thing. I actually remember I was making, putting out online music videos in the late 90s, early 2000s, when most people still had dial-up. and You would have to make these files about less than five megabytes. And these were live music uh, gig, recordings of gigs and things like that. So quite hard to to get at a good enough quality I should go through my archive drives and see if I still have any of those It'd be quite fascinating to see some of them now I mean really you can just upload videos to YouTube now without really having to care about how much space it's going to take up so seeing uh, what sort of technology they used how they managed to monetize it or not uh, and the intersection of um, I guess the online world early online world the old media and their lives. Uh, it's quite a fascinating insight. And you will, I don't actually remember this, this story, this, this, uh, this event at all, but maybe you do. Uh, or at least you will remember, if you're of a certain age, what uh, being online used to be like then. So it's quite a fascinating read. Transitioning out of uh, kind of tech now, I suppose. Well, that's a good segue, maybe. This is the news that Meetup has um, come out of WeWork and is now owned by another company. Well, actually, it's interesting because PR Newswire says acquired, but then it mentions investors. So maybe it's kind of acquired by a group of investors or maybe the wording is not quite right there. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I actually tweeted it out a couple of days ago, uh, no, last week, I think. I did an interview with the original founder of Meetup some time ago, Scott... Scott something rather, um, before they even got taken over by WeWork. And that, well, I mean, I guess it depends who you speak to whether that was a successful acquisition or not. I think it made a lot of sense for WeWork. Meetup didn't really change very much. Um, and I suppose enough people kind of think of them as separate companies that now WeWork is starting to fail. It maybe made sense for them to get out of that arrangement again. I think it's especially interesting that this happened right now when Meetup has actually gone against one of its core principles of allowing people to have online meetups. You could kind of do that in the past, but they didn't really want you to. They were very much focused on the in-person meetings, which if you listen to the uh, interview I mentioned from a couple of years ago, uh, that's actually one thing that Scott mentioned quite a lot. But due to the uh, current situation in the world, they had to allow this. It was it's quite it's actually quite an easy feature to add, I guess. And interestingly, Meetup is not a platform that has added that many features, really. And it's probably one of the first concrete features I've seen on the platform for quite some time. But it's an interesting time that this, uh, this, this company that was pretty much all about people meeting in person um, now spins out at a time when people can't really do that. So it's interesting to see how they'll go from here. But I always have a bit of a soft spot for them, to be honest with you. Next, an article on the MIT Technology Review by Abby Olheiser. This, uh, well, this is called Lockdown was supposed to be an introvert's paradise. It's not. I'm not really going to go into massive detail on the article itself. Uh, I encourage you to have a read, though. It was more what uh, thoughts it put in my head from observations of some of my friends who are very much on the introvert scale, who when uh, kind of isolation and lockdown and quarantine and whatever you want to call it in various guises began a few weeks to a few months ago, depending where you are in the world, some people I know were actually kind of not not necessarily celebrating, but as introverts, they were pretty happy. Uh, certain elements of them said, oh, not much is going to change in my life. I don't go out anyway. Some people said they were looking forward to not being forced to go outside. Uh, and actually, um, I've noticed that in the recent weeks from from where I am anyway, this has changed a bit. And actually, strangely, some of my... Um, Introvert friends are the ones struggling the most. Um, I guess this is maybe for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because you have no choice. I mean, 
if you were introverted and wanted to stay home all the time in the past, you still had choice. Um, it was, even if you subconsciously didn't take advantage of it, but just knew it was there, you still had choice. Um, I would also possibly say that people who are introverted or introverted to um, a high amount maybe tend to be warriors. And um, obviously when there's a lot of kind of bad things going on, there's a lot to worry about. There's a lot of things in the back of your mind. There might be other problems as well in your life to to contribute to um, just being generally stressed. And being an introvert is kind of just a part of that. Um, I would also think that people um, like myself who are kind of, I'm not really an extrovert, I'm somewhere on the scale, but um, who value social connection and like going to in-person meetups and meeting people and hanging out with people and traveling and going to events and all this sort of thing. Um, in some respects, we've been able to transition relatively easily to a, a, a new paradigm right now of socializing, but socializing online and still kind of doing exactly what we were doing before, but just always in our lounge room. Um, and I've seen other articles that kind of go into this. Uh, I think I saw one today that I haven't read yet, actually, um, saying that, and I'm finding this myself, that um, there's almost too much going on, which is great. I think it's great that people are providing opportunities for people to socialize and um, be exposed to new culture and things like that. Like I've watched plays in countries I can't get to with friends I haven't seen for a long time, and it's been quite amazing, but it's a bit overwhelming on top of everything else that's happening. And this might be the bigger issue with with introverts, which kind of goes back to my last point in that when other things are overwhelming, then it doesn't matter if you're in your, your safe space in your home where you feel comfortable, everything is overwhelming anyway, despite that. So anyway, it sparked a lot of thoughts in my mind about some of my friends who um, are struggling right now. Um, and even though initially they might have thought this is going to be great for someone like me, it's turning out that actually they are the ones struggling the most. And, of course, trying to help them um, is sometimes difficult. Uh, it's not even possible. You can't go and see them uh, to, to get them out of the house or something like that. So or maybe you can try, but, you know, it's difficult. So, yeah, it sparked a lot of uh, thoughts in my mind. I would actually love to hear people's opinions on, on, on that subject and the article in particular. Now, one thing that people have been doing a lot of, I know I have been, um, traditional games, playing solo and with my wife, but also online board games. A lot of people have been doing this. This is an article from Luke Plunkett on Kotaku, a site that I have referenced quite a lot when it comes to board game coverage saying that despite all this, board games are actually having a bad time, the industry itself. And this is something that has been at the back of my mind uh, with a few um, services, products that people are using a lot at the moment. This includes things like uh, Steam, um, all the various VoIP services, online board game platforms, and I guess board games themselves. In that, um, maybe not so much with board games because it's a physical product, but you'll see my point in a minute in that everyone is leaning very heavily on some of these industries. And with some of those online platforms, they're not necessarily making any more money, despite the fact they're getting a lot more demand. A, because at the moment it feels inappropriate to charge people for some of these things, or they're doing deals, or um, yeah, no one is paying. I mean, Whether it's appropriate or not, people aren't paying to match the demand. So they're a little bit kind of bitten at both ends, if that's actually a real phrase, um, in that the, the companies are getting a lot of demand and that should equal better revenue for them, but it's not necessarily. And then board games have their own kind of issues, is that um, but most board games are made in China. The Chinese supply um, infrastructure has only really just got back going. So there is a unmet supply for that demand. It's harder for them to communicate with these people. It's harder for them to go and get samples. Things are taking longer to be posted around. Um, and also then the local logistics services of even getting games, apart from using certain online retailers, is also difficult. And some of those online retailers, justly so, are prioritizing other deliveries. So it's sort of interesting that there's lots of industries that you think are doing really well out of a crisis, but maybe they are, maybe they're not. Um, and maybe that will change. And it's interesting to see how some of these sectors will cope 
in the long run when people need them, but they're still figuring it all out themselves as well. And finally, another slightly older post from Long Reads. And I'm actually struggling to see an author. Um, ah, there we go, right down the bottom. Kanishk Tharur. Um, and I came across this. This is an article called Playing With History, What Sid Meier's Video Game Empire Got Right and Wrong About Civilization. And I came across this post because I've actually been recently playing Age of Empires uh, 2, I think. And yes, I know I'm a bit behind, but I got a bit stuck with Age of Empires 2, not really knowing what to do next and how to get started with things. So I was looking for some strategy guides. And whilst I was looking for some strategy guides, I came across this post. Not directly related, but somewhat similar. I love civilization games, actually. Um, and when I say that, I mean the civilization games as well as the concept generally. Um, and the interesting thing about this article, which is always such a classic story, is everyone thinks that Sid Meier is a kind of uh, fanatical historian or something like that. And actually, when you read this article, you realize he didn't really know what he was doing. He was making it up. He just picked a very obvious historical record that most people would know, sort of thrust it into this game and didn't really pay much um, notice to whether it was accurate or whether it made any sense. And this actually creates some wonderful dynamics in the game where you can be like Genghis Khan um, getting the nuclear bomb or something like that, you know. Um, so it actually this interesting sort of flaw in the design ends up making the game what it is. So anyway, if you're a Civilization fan, have a read. So that was my links for the week. I hope you enjoyed the discussion there. And next up is my interview with Quinn Slack about Sourcegraph. Well, I am Quinn Slack. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sourcegraph. I'm a developer at heart and love building things that other developers use and love. Okay. And... You work for Sourcegraph, or you founded Sourcegraph, I guess. Um, what is it? The the website kind of says in big, bold letters, universal code search. But what does that mean? Universal code search is the one place that developers can go to find things across all of their code and to fix things across all of their code. It's like Google for your everyday life is universal web search. But when you're coding, universal code search is where you go when you need to find usage examples, you need to understand best practices or just debug code. Or if you own an API and you need to find who's using it, how can you change it? Who do you need to deprecate? Or if your site goes down and you need to figure out what are all the changes related to our access token service, for mm -hmm. example, or if you need to fix a critical security problem across all of your code. That's what universal code search is. And kind of like Google in your everyday life, when you as a developer have really good universal code search, you use it 20 times a day or more. And we are so focused on getting universal code search out to more and more developers. A lot of developers out there have it and love it. You can see some of the companies mm -hmm. that have Sourcegraph, for example, Uber, Lyft, Yelp. But also every dev at Google and Facebook has code search. They've built their internal tools and, and they love those. Yeah. So we want to get this to every developer. You even have a get your guide whose office used to be on the street behind me, but uh, oh, not anymore. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as far as I understand, um, it's something of a way to, to understand and map out kind of on a, on a case by case basis, I suppose. Um, dependencies of your application in various ways or who is dependent on your application and um, what your application depends on. Is that correct in my understanding? It knows that information, yeah. but, you know, I, I just talked about the problems that it uh, solves and the, the ways in which people use it. Just to be really concrete about what universal code search is, uh, you have a search box mm -hmm that you can type things into it and it will search across all of your company's code, all repositories, all versions on all code hosts, all version control systems, all languages, and it includes metadata from the other tools you use. So it's a search box, you type something into it, you hit enter, you see a bunch of results that are all the matches. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. It's not something magical. It's not some you know AI assistant that sits on your desk and tells you, hey, type a semicolon. It's search. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I want to make it really concrete about what that is. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, I think because for a brief second I was thinking of the feature that GitHub now has of like depends, uh, you know, um, other codes that uses this library or something like that. And that that is not what you're doing. That's, you know, one piece yeah. of it. Yeah, you, you know, that that's some of the underlying information yeah. that we can use to show you that the answer that helps you find a usage example, because yeah. if you're looking at your code, you want to see, or, you, you know, you're looking at some library, you want to see, well, how are people actually using it? You have to know that information to show people usage examples, but you have to know a lot more Yeah. because, you know, if you see a thousand different usage examples out there, well, you need to filter down and you want to see uh, what are the senior engineers on our team doing and what have they done recently? And, uh, I want to use a usage example that has test coverage. All of those signals mm-hmm. are important for you to make the best determination. Mm-hmm. You don't want to use, you know, here's how we did it 10 years ago by this person that's no longer at the company. You know, you don't want to use that one. So you got to see these other signals about your code. And SourceGraph brings all of these kinds of signals about your code together in one place. So that when you're looking at code on SourceGraph, all that information is there for you to you know, determine, is this a good way to call my code? Or mm-hmm. if you're one of, doing one of those other uh, use cases, you know, uh, is this code buggy? Is this code probably what took down our site? And we give you all that information as a developer so that you can go to one place and get your question answered. Now, you mentioned it's a search box, but I could, um, I'm could. i watching a video here whilst you're talking, and I could also imagine this being very useful in other places as well. So do you also offer... Um, IDE plugins or browser extensions or something like that as well? Yeah. yeah. We want to bring this to wherever you are. So in your IDE, you can set up SourceGraph and then makes it really easy to go from what you're doing right now to that same file on SourceGraph with all this other metadata annotations about the code. And then if you're in GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket, you can look at any code, you can look at any code review and you get all of that same code intelligence that SourceGraph has right inside of those products. It's totally seamless. So yeah, we, we come to where you are as a developer. What, actually, I should have asked this question before that question, really, but what was the origin story here? Why, why, why create this in the first place? What, what, was, what was your own personal or the team's own personal problem that you kept kind of hitting that you wanted to create SourceGraph in the first place? Well, you know, in the background, there's way more code, there's way more developers, there's way more complexity. And my co-founder and I, we felt that as developers. And I use code search at several different companies, uh, large companies, small companies. My co-founder was at Google. He used code search. And so, you know, with we call this big code, this idea that there's more code, more developers, more complexity than ever before. We felt that problem. We had seen the solution, and once you as a developer have used really good code search, you can never live without code search again. So we saw the problem, we saw the solution, and we took a, a, round, we took a look around and we said, why, why isn't every developer doing this? And we couldn't come up with a good answer, so we said, all right, we're going to go and make it so every developer does have this. And so we started SourceGraph. And how uh, can people search? I, I see on the... The front page um, video, there's like a sort of Google-ish or, you know, search engine-ish um, way of searching with um, with uh, asterisks and, and et cetera, et cetera. But also on some of your other pages, I'm starting to see kind of more um, natural language questions. I'm not sure if that's just there for an example or you know, how, how can people search? Can they only search for code patterns or can they also search for kind of code patterns in a, in a sentence or something like that? You can search for code patterns. You can search, um, you know, actually using it in a code aware way where SourceGraph understands the syntax of the language. You know, there's a lot under the hood. We want to make it so that you as a developer, you can just type in what you know or what you're looking for and SourceGraph will get you the answer. Um, in the same way, you know, you just trust that Google will get you there. Okay. So there's a lot under the hood. I can, you know, go through all the different things we do there. but. Um, you know, start as a developer, start with typing in what you're looking for. And we hope to get you there through a combination of, you know, filtering and expansion and understanding the code. 
And our goal is to be the place where you can get your question answered 99.9% of the time, mm -hmm. because that's what, that's what uh, search has to be able to do for it to be really good. And we are doing that for a lot of developers. And that's why people use our product a lot. I'm guessing as you're definitely going for an enterprise play, um, you can also connect up um, local repositories and private repositories and things like that. I'm assuming that would be a necessity. Otherwise, the, the tool would be useless to a lot of enterprises. But just to double check. Yeah, yeah, that's totally right. So, I mean, the problem is big code and... You know, who has the problem? Well, anyone with a ton of code, a ton of complexity, a ton of devs. And that happens to be, you know, a lot of large enterprises. It also is totally true in the open source world. And, you know, we are a ton of people use Sourcegraph for open source as well. But our business is helping companies. And Sourcegraph is totally self-hosted. So you run it inside your company. It is very secure. You load all of your code into Sourcegraph, but it's totally in your own network. And you manage it. So you can get started. You don't need to go get approval from anyone else. You can run it on your own laptop and see it working across all of your code. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned as well as um, uh, code hosting, um, the main ones here, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, some others as well, in, in including just uh, to uh, your own, rolled your own Git repositories. But you also mentioned other services in the workflow, Datadog, uh, Lightstep, Jira, a couple of others that are sort of less um, familiar or less coder focused. But how how do they work into the search flow? I mean, I can think of Datadog, for example. If I search for a certain function, does it let me drill down into performance and and monitoring of of that function in Datadog records? Is that one example? Yeah, that's okay. exactly right. Any other service that knows stuff about code. We want to show in Sourcegraph so that you as a dev, you have that, that one place to go. So here's where this is really cool. Imagine, you know, you are an engineer at a large company and your company has a lot of these different kinds of tools. You have Datadog, you have New Relic, you have Sentry, you have code coverage, you have some other internal tools. And, you know, you've been working there for a few months. You, you, don't, you don't know all these tools by heart. You don't know when you should use one or the other. Um, we want to make it so that when you are going to that one place you go to solve your problems, for example, when you need to figure out why is the service that you own causing problems in production, mm -hmm. you don't know which one of those services to go start looking for, but you know that Sourcegraph has the answer. You know, it's going to get you to where the answer is. So you pull up the code on Sourcegraph and then in Sourcegraph, you'll see, you know, for this, these lines of code, they're actually throwing a lot of errors in production right now. And that will then link you to Sentry, which will let you see the errors mm -hmm. and go from there. So we make all these tools way more accessible to devs and we help them fulfill their promise of, um, you know, they know a lot of important stuff about code and uh, getting that information to developers in the workflow instead of relying on developers to wake up in the morning and think, oh, I'm going to go to this other tool to find the answer to my question, which, mm -hmm. you know, as we all know, uh, that's that's not how things work when you have so many different tools in an enterprise setting. The one on that list that I, I'm start, not quite understanding how it relates is HubSpot. Is that for the customer feedback <laughs> or something? Or <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually made the HubSpot integration, and this solves a problem uh, that's really clear. We have a private uh, GitHub repository with a bunch of issues that mm. – are specific things that we're solving for customers, or we would like to deliver this feature to customers. And we also have a lot of public issues on GitHub where we want to say, well, what customers are affected or want this thing? Um, we have a integration with HubSpot that lets you basically type a, you know, uh, as you're typing a GitHub issue, you can type the dollar sign and then type the customer name and it'll be auto-completed with the URL to that customer's record on our HubSpot, ah, okay. which is our CRM, yeah. you know, our, our, um, where we store all of our customer records. And so for what that means is in all of our GitHub issues, our markdown files, you see these HubSpot URLs, but uh, as a source graffer, when you're looking at those, they're actually translated into the customer name. So we have amazing insight into all of our issues and what customers care about what. And that's the kind of thing where, um, 
it's when you have one place where you can roll out a developer tool and get it in the workflow of every developer, um, you know, which is what SourceGraph lets you do. You can do these kinds of things. Um, that that I'm I'm particularly proud of that, uh, and you know I think you'll see more of those. And Jira is another example, yeah, of a tool like that. Yeah, for sure. And I guess that relates directly to issues, maybe. Yeah. So <laughs> you know, with with Jira, it's we have a ton of customers using Jira, and they'd like to do things like they run a search and they see everywhere where they're using this deprecated library, mm. and they just want to make a Jira issue with a checklist from all those search results. Mm-hmm. So that one's a little mm-hmm. clearer. And I'm suppose, I suppose in the future, although this is a question I usually ask later, but just because we're talking about the subject, there might be some obvious integrations with Freshdesk, Zendesk, those sorts of tools as well. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so then as a developer, when you're debugging code, you could see what are all the customers that actually, you know, are use this or are waiting on a fix here which is useful information in a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. And now one, one other claim you have here is all programming languages are supported. I would love to, to, to try and challenge that. But the, the bit that's more interesting <laughs> is 32 <laughs> programming languages have additional code intelligence support. Um, is that basically emulating kind of uh, code intelligence features in IDEs, but on the wider scale, I suppose. Is, is that my understanding of that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, and what does that look like in my ID? Do I get a, like a very long, potentially long list of, of uh, connections to that piece of code? Or is it more of a summary and then jump to the source graph site to see more? Well, let me just... You know, talk about the before source graph or the without source graph scenario yeah. in your editor. Even if you have really good editor language support set up for your code, you're only going to get results. You know, find references, library documentation. You're only going to get that from stuff that's on your local machine, and that usually will not include the other projects at your company. And once you get to a reasonable size, you know, you're kind of working in the dark if you're just looking at what is in your editor and what's local. So with SourceGraph, whenever, you know, with the, when we say universal code search, we mean it works across all of your code. And that means find references will show you how it's being called everywhere across all of the projects in your code, including, you know, in some cases, even other languages, if you're using something like protocol buffers or thrift or something like that. And that's the magic. So you know, we're not trying to replace your editor's language support and we don't replace your editor's language support. That works great when you're typing and you want autocomplete, you know, that's, um, you know, for the file before you've even saved it. But when you want to see things across all of your code, that's when you go to source graph. So the editor extensions make it really easy to, you know, go from that file you're working on to source graph and then see, well, where is this thing being called across all of my code? Or I want to jump to the definition in some other project. So it integrates really nicely. And because it doesn't change how your editor works, you don't need to worry about it, you know, changing how you've configured your editor. You also, as you're solving a problem on a day-to-day basis, you know, you don't need to worry about you've got your editor all set up, you're just coding, you're in the flow. You can open up SourceGraph in a web browser, and that doesn't ruin all your editor tabs in your flow. You can go open your web browser, get the answer to your question, and then go back to your editor, and it's uh, just like it was, you can get back in the flow. I'd just like to ask about, you have this uh, code, change, code change management feature where you, you call the, I guess, the, the, the <laughs> I can't think of the right word, but you have code change management where you have these things called campaigns, which is an interesting choice of word because campaigns will usually mean something more sort of marketing focused. So maybe explain what campaigns means in your context just to, understand how that could be useful if you need to make a change across a lot of different projects Mm. if you need to open up 10 100 a thousand pull requests across a lot of different projects well if if you've done that it's super super painful to do that and that's what a campaign is it's it's uh, a bunch of different pull requests Mm. that are all connected and they're all to 
deprecate something across all of your code, to fix something across all of your code, to okay. upgrade something across all of your code. And Sourcegraph makes it so much easier to create all those changes, open them up as pull requests, get them assigned to the right people, to monitor the progress of that. And finally, you know, to know we have fixed this across all of our code, we can finally sleep again at night. Okay. I, yeah, it's making me think of, uh, I did see a talk recently. I was going to find the. Uh, Facebook recently talked about how they do this internally. Yeah. Google does this code, internally. Code mods and, or something like that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Facebook yeah, but uses you're giving an overview of the whole process as well as just doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Code mods. That was it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, and we call it campaign. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. You know, the companies that do this at large scale already. Yeah. Some some of them are our customers. They call it campaign. For sure. A campaign for updating dependencies or something like that. A, a campaign yeah. for removing depreciated functions, that kind of thing. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And actually the presentations I saw on code mods sometimes made it seem like more work than <laughs> They're just doing a big regex <laughs> or something. So, so, yeah. So, so, all right. It's a ton of work. I mean, this yeah. process can take, it can take weeks or months to go and get something fixed or changed across a lot of different projects if you're doing it manually. But with Sourcegraph, you can roll out the change automatically. You can get it, you know, uh, teed up so that the code owners can see the change in their normal process and they can approve it quickly. A lot of times they could even say, uh, for any future campaigns, you know, we'd like some of them to be auto-approved. So yeah, yeah. you can get this done so much more quickly with yeah. uh, campaigns than by doing it manually. Yeah. This is solving a huge pain. All right. So um, how old is the the company at the moment, actually, by the way? We started it about six years ago. Okay. All right. So um, so you're not rushing just to... to um to create new things, which is good. Sometimes I speak to companies and my, fin my one of my final questions is always, what's next? And sometimes they're so early, everything's next. Um, <laughs> so for you as a reasonably mature tech company, what is on the roadmap for the next six months or so? We want to get universal code search out to more and more companies. And that means more and more developers. That means making it more and more universal. So we talked about uh, you know, all the different kinds of information that Sourcegraph knows about code, uh, how it's across all repositories. We want to make it um, across even more repositories so that if you're a company and you use a ton of open source to be able to seamlessly, you know, search across both private and public code. And that means, you know, potentially millions or hundreds of millions. We want to have deeper support and more coverage for all the languages so that we have even more compiler information. We have even more deep static analysis. We want to integrate more of the services that developers love. Mm -hmm. So deeper integration with things like Datadog, Sentry, New Relic, Lightstep, code mm -hmm. coverage, um, also other metrics that companies care about on code, such as code churn, mm -hmm. bring in more stuff around how is this code running mm -hmm. right now? Mm -hmm. Where is it deployed? And uh, take all of that. You know, all of that is things that make it so Sourcegraph knows more about code and make it so developers can use that when they're trying to, you know, find things with search. Also make it so developers can use that information to go and fix their code mm -hmm. with campaigns. <laughs> so bringing in more things, making it more universal. Yeah. And you have some almost endless integration points. There's new developer tools that are somewhat relevant all the time. I guess, yeah, you have to focus on what people are actually using. We know that developers yeah. have a tendency to want to change all the time for no, not always for valid reasons. So, <laughs> is, all right, <laughs> valid reasons to them. And <laughs> yeah, for sure. We we are the kind of product, you know, it, in our in our, uh, we think eventually every developer will be using Sourcegraph. So <laughs> we have to meet all developers where they are. We have to make Sourcegraph work in every developer's workflow. So. We appreciate the choices that every developer has made. We don't take sides. We want to make it so no matter you know where you are, what you use, you have amazing universal code search. Uh, on that note, so you do actually, if you want everyone to use it, you do have a free plan. It's just code search, not the pull requests and integrations. 
So you get some of the way there. Um, I guess the interesting question would be there, bearing in mind some of the other things you said, is do you offer any special deals for open source projects or is it very much up to the kind of typical uh, enterprise um, patron of an open source project to, to sign up instead? Well, for open source projects, for any public code, I got great news. Okay. Sourcegraph.com has all public code, all open source code on it. And okay. you can just go to sourcegraph.com and search it there. Oh. It's it's already going to work. <laughs> all open source code. This is another, another, <laughs> another challenge accepted to try and see if that's actually true. I, I think it'd be interesting for people to, to, to to see i don't know it's hard to know yeah <laughs> i guess if you've you have open source code that you haven't actually published anywhere yeah you know yeah, well, yeah. Then <laughs> that would not <laughs> that's reasonable <laughs> yeah but otherwise if you got a project on any of the major code hosts yeah. then you can just go to it and it'll be there and if it's at some other url then you can just you know file an issue and all right that okay, added. great great and yeah, so it works at massive scale. And by the way, sourcegrab.com is running the same exact software that you could also run inside, you know, your own company. It's okay. just we run it publicly yeah, for the world. For sure. Yeah, that's also a good test bed for people to um to to see how it works on something realistic yeah. as opposed to kind of dummy data. So yeah. Um final question I always ask is is there anything you want to make sure is mentioned that we haven't covered already? No, that's it. All right. you, you had awesome questions. Great <laughs> prep. Thank you. And that was my article with Quinn Slack of Sourcegraph. I hope you found that interesting. So what have I been trying this week? Okay, we're about to start um, test recordings for a new podcast, Board Game Jerk, based on my Twitter bot. More of that next week. Started editing a new storytelling podcast. I've been doing some more live streams. Um, mostly documentation work. You can also now sign up, uh, contact me for details. You can also now sign up for um, Office Hours with me where I'll help you with documentation projects, documentation tooling, things like that. Mostly doing uh, Wednesday and Friday, uh, 3 to 5 p.m. Central European time, hopefully overlapping a little bit with American time there. Um, and if that doesn't work for you, then please let me know. You can find more details of all those things on christianchiller.com uh, slash contact slash support or just click around. I think it's fairly obvious where you'll find pieces of information. Apart from that, I have been working on some articles, mostly getting published soon. Some of them have been fairly um, long uh, long projects, <laughs> maybe. Um, yeah. And I guess that's about all I have to report right now. Sometimes I forget what I have done. I should make a note, really, shouldn't I? I should be better at promoting things. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the show. Please rate, review, share wherever you found it. And until next time, if you have been, thank you very much for listening.